thanks for coming here. Uh, lovely to see you. Uh, this is a, a two-header presentation around a, a project linking preparedness, response, and resilience in emergency contexts. I'll introduce the other speaker and myself first of all, and then we'll take you through some of the methodologies and the results. We think it's an exciting project and something we want to share, not just because of the results, but because of the methodology. It's a very tight collaboration between an academic institution and a practice institution. So we have some lessons to, to share with you, particularly in discussion afterwards, if you wish, about that sort of relationship and how it can be productive for both partners. Just to introduce us first, this is uh, Michael Mosselman, who's the head of uh, humanitarian work in Christian Aid. And he's going to take us through some of the key outcomes of the work in a couple of minutes. My name is Mark Pelling from King's College London, and I will take you through the framing of the project. The key aim of our project was to focus on resilience and the extent to which resilience can be built in the response phase of a disaster through preparedness action. So as the title says, we're accepting a need to work at preparedness to enable an appropriate response through the relationships in particular that have been built in the preparedness phase to enable something called resilience. The mode of working was very much was very much to ask local respondents what they thought of the practice, of the performance, and indeed of the ideas that underpinned our work, which surprisingly is quite unusual in this kind of agenda. Most of the work, and it's a long-going discussion and area of, uh, of innovation around how to build resilience, how to do development better through response, most of the assessments focus on conversations with the humanitarian practitioners. They do not ask the views of, of local actors at risk. So that was our starting point, to capture the recommendations and perceptions made by local stakeholders. So the first question we asked is, what is resilience for you? And resilience is a very murky field. There are many definitions of resilience. But it was clear across our different field sites that resilience meant a balance between independence and support when needed. So you, not new ideas, but this is quite powerful evidence coming from the voices of those people who have lived through a response driven by external actors. So they're acknowledging a need for support, but it'd be somehow shaped much more by their own voices, their own uh, expectations, and so on. I should say that the evidence that we developed has been collected through working across six emergency responses uh, to do with natural disasters and two post-conflict events. So we collected the data across those uh, all continents of the world, and now we're moving towards um, uh, a list of priorities that will be taken into live response, which Michael's organization will be leading. So I'm just going to read through these key principles that have come from our work, and then Michael will take us through each one and spend a minute or so on each one. But they're important enough that I'll just read through them slowly so that you can, you can understand them. The first, and to my mind the most exciting, is to allow and enable the community to co-run the response. And th as Michael will say in a second, this has implications for budget as well as the framing of the response. So a really significant potential shift in responsibility for the response. The second point, coordinating interventions and work with the government. So acknowledging this isn't uh, a, a voice from those at risk seeking to take over government role or indeed for the humanitarian sector, very much a, a desire for local actors for collaboration with government. A third is to support community cohesion and establish effective two-way communication 
between crisis survivors and implementing organizations. So that will be familiar to many of you working in the humanitarian sector, the need for two-way communication. Addressing underlying causes of vulnerability to protect and prepare, also I think well known, but always a difficult issue to bring into a response. Psychosocial support and livelihoods, income generation, cash and savings. So many of those are, are well-known areas. The power from this comes from it being from the voice of those affected, capped with this first point around community-run initiatives. So with that, I'll hand over to Michael. Which one do you press to go forward? Left and right to go. So right, go forward. Yeah. Okay, so we, um, we, we spoke to three or 400 crisis survivors in eight crises and they came up with six key recommendations for us about how we can do how we can plan and deliver humanitarian response to leave the communities more resilient to future shocks and so these are the six main recommendations that the crisis survivors told us like mark said so the first is that we must try to um, let communities run their own response as far as possible. We need to turn the system on its head and have, rather than have INGOs and local NGOs coming in and running the response for communities, the communities should run the response and we should facilitate them to do that so in a supportive role. And the Local to Global Protection Initiative of Dan Church Aid and Church of Sweden is pioneering new approaches to enable us to do this and we're working with them to try to move that agenda forward. The second is that the, the communities told us that they felt it was very chaotic of too many agencies are trying to work in the same community at the same time, so they would rather we had a very well-coordinated approach, preferably with just one actor leading in each community. And they also were very keen that we should work with um, governments as far as possible, so that if the government is not is willing but not able to, to help to improve disaster management, then we should try to work to strengthen the government's capacity to do so. And if the, if the government is able and not willing to strengthen disaster management, then we should help to strengthen the community's capacity to advocate for the government to do a better job. But they were very keen that for a sustainable future, the government needed to be involved. Okay, and uh, thirdly, they, they, they were very keen that, that in order to be resilient, they needed to have a cohesive community where everybody was together and everybody was included. And they complained about occasional poor communication by um, humanitarian actors in terms of they didn't know when the, the, the humanitarian actor was going to come, what it was going to do, where it was going to do it. So, they, so better communication with disaster defect communities was a big theme for them. Fourth, they, they, they thought that um, for a long-term sustainable future, we need to tackle the root causes of disasters, and some humanitarian agencies aren't always good at doing that. And the occasion of a crisis creates some political space to advocate for better protection and better human rights for communities. And it's our moral responsibility to take advantage of that political space and seize the moment and help with advocacy for protection and human rights. And then fifth, they said that the, the aid that they valued most, but that we weren't particularly, we, we weren't so frequently good at doing, was psychosocial support. So we tend to, as a humanitarian community, sometimes we tended to be better at meeting the material needs of populations rather than their psychosocial needs or their spiritual needs. And they're traumatized. Many times they, they told us they're traumatized by the disaster and they can't get on with their life unless we focus quite heavily on their psychosocial needs as well as their material needs. And then finally, they emphasized to us, these, these 400 disaster victims that we spoke to about what we could do better, that for them it was key that in order to rebuild their lives, they need to have a, a sustainable income into the future so that they have the resources to deal with the next um, challenges that they face. And so they, they urged us to focus more than we tend to on livelihoods, on savings, on cash, and kind of, they, I think that they felt that the humanitarian community often comes with a supply-driven approach which says that we've got some food and we've got some shelter and here's some food and here's some shelter. But oftentimes what they actually want is help with getting them a sustainable job or help with education for their children. And we tend to give what we want and not what they want. And so... Um, we're working in a consortium on this program with nine, with nine other agencies, including some of you, and our idea is to try to um, remodel our humanitarian response to take these six 
thematic priorities that communities have told us they want into account better when we move forward, and we're going to pilot it. Our next step is to try to pilot this in Myanmar and Kenya, including working with Christian Aid, Dan Church Aid, and Church of Sweden. And we're going to try to train our partners and our staff in how they can push forward on these six approaches. And then we're going to, when the next crisis comes, try to deliver these six approaches in the way that we design and implement humanitarian aid, and then try to see what works and doesn't work, and learn from that going forward. So that is our presentation. We've got about um, three minutes left. So I don't know if anybody wanted to ask Mark or me a question. If, if, you, if, you, if you don't have one now, we're obviously we're very happy to talk to you in the margins. I just wondered what type of disasters were you responding to, if, you know? Yeah, so we looked in, we, we went to interview um, communities um, about our responses in eight crises, and two of them were conflict situations where, the, where, the, the, where displacement was a significant problem. Two of them were um, typhoons, one of them was a cyclone, one of them was a tsunami, and one of them was a flood. So they were kind of six, six of them were natural, and one of them was a drought. So six of them were natural disasters, and two were conflict displacement situations. Did you find significant differences between populations affected by natural disasters and populations affected by complex emergencies? Uh, would the order of the priorities that you identify change? Yes, I mean, th th there, there are a lot of differences and, and we've, we've published our full 40-page report on the website of this conference, so you, I mean, it's, it's difficult to go into enormous detail in, in the one minute that remains, but, but if you want, we can, we can email you the report and you can see, but yes. I mean, the thing was that these six thematic priorities um, rang true in all eight crises, and so they were the ones that we emphasized, but there are a lot of other differentials from crisis to crisis where some things loom large in one another, so absolutely. Could you say a bit more about the psychological report, uh, uh, support that the communities requested? I mean, that was in, in particular, that was in Indonesia and Philippines, um, um, related to the tsunami a long time ago, and related to Typhoon Haiyan. And they was, I mean, one, one ele I mean, one element of it was that they felt very traumatised by those crises, and, and they, they felt that um, um, the, the most valuable aid that they has got from some of their aid agencies, but not others, was was a kind of psychosocial counselling and, and trying to help them to build through that. And that was what they felt should be a much more high priority component of what we delivered to them. But also there was, there was a kind of spiritual element with some of the communities that we spoke to where they felt that their faith was something that helped them to... Um, deal with the crisis, and so we should kind of bear that in mind. But the, the, I think the humanitarian sector, we're mostly quite secular in our approaches, but we should bear in mind that some of the communities we work with um, regard faith as an important thing that, um, that, that helps them to survive, and, and we should be aware of that. Mark, do you want to answer any of the questions? We've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so the psychology was certainly one of the more important ones, and I guess it's something that humanitarian acts is already gearing up to respond to. The gap that was most original was the first one, I think, around the possibility of local budgeting for humanitarian response. So for me, the most exciting, not applicable in every context, as you're suggesting, but something that came up in each of the contexts of the work, even going as far as suggesting local governments in collaboration with community groups should receive a budget and then subcontract humanitarians that might have expertise in various uh, parts of re relief and response. So this is not cash transfer that we're talking about. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Time's up, so we'll let the next speaker come on.